Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today is tax day here in the United States, April 15th, and so today we're going to talk about tax records. Like you, your ancestors had to pay taxes for a variety of reasons, and so tax records, tax lists, tax index, indexes, all of those things were created, um, and all of those things can serve a genealogical purpose. So today we're going to talk about the purpose of those records genealogically, where on Ancestry.com and some other places that you can find them, and then how to work with them or what to do with them. Let's go ahead and dive in. So let's first talk about um, why you want to use tax records, what they're going to do for you genealogically. Um, the first thing is uh, that people were rarely missed on tax records. So for example, where you might be searching through a census and the information may or may not be complete, tax records are almost always complete for their purposes. Um, the, the people who were looking for the, for the money, the government, was not going to miss people in those particular records. And so you're going to find that they're pretty, um, pretty complete. They also predate census records and fill in the gaps between the census. So here in the United States, the federal census is only taken every 10 years. We began taking the census here in the United States in 1790, and we've taken it all the way up through the current day. However, only the last, um, there's a 72 year privacy law, and so the latest available census is 1940. So we have censuses available from 1790 through 1940, with the exception of the 1890 census, which unfortunately was destroyed in a fire. And so we have these census records every 10 years, and that's great. They do, they're a hugely valuable resource, but a 10 year gap is a long time, and so tax records help fill in that gap. Also, prior to 1850, only the head of household was listed on uh, the census record. So it didn't list every member of the household. So you could have three or four um, adult males living in a household. Maybe it's a father and some of his sons who haven't married yet. Or maybe it's a man and his wife and his children and his father-in-law and a brother-in-law, right? You don't know um, what makes up or who makes up that household because only the head of household is listed. And so these records not only help us fill in the gaps in between censuses, but they predate um, they certainly go back before 1850 when every, when every member of the household started being enumerated. And they even predate 1790 when the U.S. federal census started being taken. And so they're really valuable because of that. They also, um, like I mentioned, will include uh, anybody who was of age, any male who was of age in a household, whereas the census prior to 1850 will only include that head of household. Also, um, men were first taxed when they were about when they were 21 years old. Um, that's a pretty consistent law in the places where taxes were levied, and so that's important information to know because what's going to happen is you're going to be going along looking through tax records for a particular county, say, and you're all of a sudden going to discover that this man shows up. Well, that's a pretty big clue that one of two things has happened. Either he's come of age, meaning he's turned 21, which means now you have a pretty good clue of his age or his approximate birth year, or he's just moved into or purchased property in that area. So these tax records, again, serve a really good clue, as really good clues um, to what's happening with these families that you're researching. Another reason why tax records are so important for genealogy is they allow you to really quickly look and see if there are multiple people with the same name in the areas that you're researching. One of the things that I want you to start thinking more about as you do family history research is less about name-based research and more about location-based research. We get very stuck in the idea that I'm looking for this person. But what we need to also be doing is looking at this location. So for example, if your family is from Frederick County, Virginia, I would hope that you would search for anybody with that surname in that county. I do those kinds of searches constantly in tax records, in censuses, in vital records, in military records. I want to know anybody who has that surname, even a common surname, in a specific location. Let me give you an example. 
Last night on our Facebook group, I was working with a gentleman, or several of us were working with a gentleman who was looking for a Lewis family um, in a particular county, I think it was Boyle County, Kentucky. Now you would think that with a name like Lewis, I think the first name was Henry, Henry Lewis, that you're gonna have thousands and thousands of search results. Well, the reality is I just put in Lewis into the search into the search form, Lewis with a lived in location of Boyle County, Kentucky. I marked both of those exact and the man I was looking for came up on the first page of search results for every one of the censuses that we were looking for him in. That's the kind of things that I want you to start thinking about as you do your searches. Uh, very often we throw way too much information at the search engine and this is a way to just say you know what I just want to see these people in this specific location use that lived in field on the advanced search form make sure you select when you start typing I'll show you here in a minute but make sure you select from the type ahead and then mark it exact and it will filter your search results really quickly right down to just a specific location and so I, that brings me back to this point which is Tax lists allow you to really quickly see if there are other people with the same name living in the same location. I have an ancestor whose name is Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones had a son named Daniel Jones. Four of Daniel's sons also named sons Daniel Jones. And so he's got these great four grandsons, two of whom are born within a year of each other, who all have the same name. Tax lists allow you to quickly discover that so that you make sure you grab the right person, okay? As you follow them through the tax list, you start to see some little differences between people with the same name, and it allows you to differentiate them. It also um, makes sure that you don't, um, uh, what's the word, conflate people, that you don't um, merge people together, that you know that there are two people, not just one person who happens to be kind of all over the place. Um, it also, and I think I mentioned this briefly, tax lists help you to determine when a person moved in and out of a specific area, or possibly even when they may have died. So really, really valuable genealogically, right? You're going through tax lists, you find, you know, you find George Lawrence over and over and over and over again, year after year after year after year, and then all of a sudden one year he just disappears. Well, that tells me one of two things, either he died, <laughs> or he moved out of the area or sold his property. So I need to then be looking for death records in that specific time and place, or I need to be looking for property records in that specific time and place to see, did he sell his property? Did he move on? So hopefully that gives you an idea of the value of tax records as you uh, do your genealogy. So let's talk about um, what kind of information is included on them. Usually they're just a list, just a list of names. And that may feel like there's that, that it's not really valuable, but hopefully I've shared with you enough already that you know that there's some real value in these records. Sometimes it also will include what's called a personal property inventory. Depending on the kind of tax being levied, um, that will determine how this information is recorded or what information is recorded. Sometimes the tax man wanted a detailed inventory or list of the personal property of the person being taxed so that they could have an accounting of exactly what they were being taxed on. Sometimes they just wanted a total dollar amount and that was written and then the amount of tax was written. It just depends. Um, it depends on the time period. It depends on the laws that were in effect at the time and place. Um, and then it depends on what survived. Is what has survived and been given to us just a list or is it the original tax records? One of the things, one of the benefits about tax records is that they're organized by place. So um, we'll look at some examples here in just a minute, but some tax records are federal, like the IRS tax records and Ancestry.com has, I think, 8.8 .8 million of those. Um, some of those are, are organized, right, like fe they're federal records, but then within that they're organized by state and then by county and then by township, much like the federal census. Some of these tax records are for specific counties or for specific states. Um, or uh, even colonies, they even date back that far. So um, understanding how the records are organized helps you understand what it is that you're looking at and very often can help you understand where these people are living. 
always look for other family members and pay attention to neighbors. Now, some tax lists are organized alphabetically um, and some tax lists are organized like a census where they're kind of by neighborhood, by, yeah, by neighborhood, um, where they kind of go in order of how people are living or how the tax man um, walked the beat, I guess. And so look and see how the, you know, sometimes you have to go back and forward a couple of pages to get an idea for how the records are organized. If they're organized alphabetically, look for those other surnames, other people with the same surname, just they should be right there, right? If they're organized by neighborhood, again, that gives you a good idea, just like a census of who's living where and who might be connected. Pay attention to those neighbors. Very often those neighbors are going to be sons-in-law or brothers-in-law or fathers-in-law. Um, you're going to see different relationships start to emerge as you understand who's living near this person particularly the further back in time you go, the more likely there is to be a family connection between those neighbors. Now, another piece of information that's included on tax records is uh, the taxable profession and the number of employees. Different professions uh, were taxed differently, and so you start to get a feel not just for their property, but for their occupation, their prominence in the society as well. Okay, now, <coughs> excuse me. Let's talk about where to find those tax records. If you spend any time with me at all, you know how much I love the card catalog. It is where I go to begin almost all of my searches because I don't want to search all 13 billion records on Ancestry.com, which is what you do when you just do a general search. I very often want to go look for a specific kind of record, do some of these location-based searches. So you're going to go to search and card catalog. And then you're going to either put the word tax in the title field and click search, or you're going to use the filters on the left-hand side of the screen. Let me show you um, what that looks like. Let's see if I can get to my, there we go, Ancestry.com. And we're going to hover over search. Just move your mouse over it. Hover over search. And we're going to come down here and click on card catalog. That's going to show you that Ancestry.com has 31,688 databases. Now I can just put the word tax in here. That'll filter me down to about 52 databases. However, not all tax lists are called out specifically as tax lists. So even better, if you just use these filters over here, I'm going to come over here, click on tax, criminal, land, and wills. Then I'm going to filter even further down to tax lists. And if I want to filter further even down to the United States, I can do that. Now, of course, there are tax lists for other countries as well. But since it's tax day here in the United States, we're going to focus on that. There are 81 databases contained in this category of tax lists. And you can see here most of them have the title or the word tax in their title, but some of them do not. Some of them are actually listed as census records or reconstructed census records. So one of the things you might not be aware of is that, um, well, you, you probably do know that the 1890 census was destroyed in a fire, but there are previous censuses for specific locations that are missing um, Kentucky, New Jersey, North Carolina, parts, large chunks, um, and sometimes even the entire state um, of those censuses for certain years are entirely missing. And so tax lists provide a good what we call census substitute or a good way to reconstruct the census because the purpose of the census is just to enumerate or count who's living where when, right? And tax lists allow you to do that. So you may see things with different titles, compiled census, census substitute. Um, here's a Pennsylvania published archive series. So they're not all entitled tax lists, but that gives you a good idea. If you use the filters, it gives you a good idea of what's available. Now, if you know that you're looking specifically for family in a very specific location, let's say Virginia, you can even filter further down by state. That's going to take me to a list of, looks like about nine census or tax lists. Okay, so that's how you use the card catalog. Hover over search, go to card catalog, and then use those filters on the left hand side to narrow down to tax lists and then by geography. You can even narrow it down further by time period if you end up with a big list or if you want to see specifically what's available for the 1700s or, um, or 1820s, whatever. Okay.
Now, um, let's talk about how to use some of these tax lists. The first thing I'm going to tell you to do, and I encourage this no matter what kind of record you're dealing with, is always read that database description. So when you are in a database, let's, let's look at, here's the IRS tax records, 8.8 .8 million records from 1862 to 1918, um, okay? When you get to a specific database, always scroll past that search box and underneath there you're going to find two things. The first thing you're going to find is what we call our source information. Okay, That's how we craft those sources that we attach to your database when you attach a record. That's going to tell you where Ancestry.com obtained these particular records. In this case, they've been online since 2008. We obtained them from the National Archives. Here is the, the microfilm, the original microfilm information. Below that is what we call our database description, where we explain what these records are, why they were created, how they're going to help you, how you can search them, what information is included, what information was indexed so that you can search versus what information is actually in the record that you need to look at rather than just relying on that index. Um, there's going to be information about um, how often the records were created and, and that's important because if a record was just created once then you know you're only looking for your ancestor once. But in this case, right, we know we pay taxes all the time. Um, tax day comes around every single year and so we know that it's likely that we're going to find our ancestor year after year after year. So we're not going to stop with finding them just once in a particular database. We're going to want to look over and over again. Lots of information in this particular database description is really lengthy, but it gives really, really good um, information. Right down here near the bottom, though, and this is important, there are a lot of databases on Ancestry that contain this information. We've given you specific coverage years for each state. So even though the entire database, uh, what was the coverage for the entire database? Um, 1862 through 1918. So the whole database, the earliest record is 1862, the latest record is 1918. But what you're going to notice here is that not every state uh, has all of those years accounted for. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Sometimes the records were destroyed before they were turned over to the federal government accidentally or intentionally. Sometimes those records, um, you know, only some of the records were turned over to the federal government and some of the records are still held at a state archive or a state library, which is important to know because then you can contact that state archive or that state library and see if you can get access to additional years. And so always look for coverage information. Where we know explicitly what it is, we'll include that in the database description. And so you can see here, if I was looking, for example, for family from Georgia, there's only two years included, 1865 and 1866. So when I come up here and I do my search, I know what to expect. Okay, so let me just give you a quick search example. Um, I'm going to reset all of my filters here so that you can see how I do this from the beginning. Hopefully you're using the advanced search form. That's going to give you always, always, when you search anything, use the advanced search form. That's going to give you the most control over your search. It's also going to give you the best search results. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to type in George Lawrence and I know that he lives in Georgia, okay? Those are the only three things. I'm, you do not have to fill out every field, okay? Now, I'm going to check mark, match all terms exactly. You'll notice that changes my search filters here underneath each field to restrict to exact or adds a little checkbox. Let me just show you that again, right? You just toggle it on and off, okay? Now, some of these um, I'm actually going to adjust, and here's why. Um, when you search by a name, one of the things that I have discovered in some of these government records in particular is that sometimes they'll record them by name, sometimes they'll record them by a nickname or an abbreviated form of their name, and sometimes they'll record them just by their initials. I want to capture all of those variations in one search. I don't want to have to search over and over and over. So once I've set everything to exact, I can come in here to this name filter and I can just change that to um, that I also want phonetic matches, names with similar meanings and spellings, and records where only initials are recorded. And that makes sure I catch all of those particular variations of that name George. It'll give me George, it'll give me GEO, it'll give me anybody with the initial G. Um, and you can control that. I mean, you can decide 
how much or how little of that you want. Sometimes it helps just to do a search, see what comes up in your search results, and then adjust that as you need to. And we give you those adjustment sliders over here. I could say, oh, well, I really didn't need initials, so I can back off of that. Um, you, know, you can play with those yourself. So one of the things you're going to notice here now that I've got my search results, all four of them, um, is that there's only those two years recorded. I've got a George D. Lawrence in 1865. He's listed twice, so that's going to be worth investigating. Is this really the same guy? Or is it he was taxed on personal property and taxed on business property? And if you look at 1866, it looks like that's very likely what happened. Here he's listed as George D. Lawrence. Here he's listed as George D. Lawrence and company. Always, always, always go look at the actual record. This is not the actual record. This is just the record index page. Always click through to that original image where it exists. Make sure that you see exactly what's included on that. Here's George Lawrence. Um, there's some information here. You need to scroll up sometimes and read those um, column headings so that you know exactly what information is being included here. In this case, we see it lists his location. Um, so it's not just Georgia. It actually lists a specific county, in this case, Macon County. Um, it lists an article or an occupation, uh, the quantity or the valuation, and then his tax rate. So lots of really great information. Um, I can follow him year by year. In this case, the state of Georgia only has those two years in this particular database, but that's still, like I said, really, really valuable information. Now, you just looked at some there that were handwritten. Some of these records are um, typed, meaning they were originally Let's see if I can spell it incorrectly. Um, they were originally probably, well, they were originally handwritten, and over time these records have been typed into books or ledgers or whatever to turn over to um, whatever particular archive wanted to make them accessible or available. And that's what Ancestry.com has been allowed to index is those typed lists. And so you'll see here in my search results, there actually are typed lists. Now, one of the other things that you um, need to be aware of is that not all tax is property based. Um, sometimes it's about um, voting. In this case, a, there was a poll tax or a poll list. And so this, um, this particular book, it's going to clear up here as soon as it gets into focus. Um, this particular book here actually um, lists some information about the law of the time and why this list was created and why these particular men are on this list. And then um, you can see it's just a list of names. But if you hadn't scrolled to the top of the page or to the page before or the page after, you would miss this explanatory information. And so that's um, another really good piece of information is always try to find the explanatory information. Sometimes it's at the very beginning of the book. So you'll have to jump down here. You see these images. You can jump to image number one and then scroll your way one by one through the pages to help understand the records a little bit better. They almost always explain it. You just have to know how to get there. So you just use these image, this image down here, type in a number, jump to that particular image, and then scroll through it just like you would a book or a reel of microfilm until you find that explanatory information. That's going to explain not just what the records are. It might explain more about how to use them. It might explain any abbreviations that you find. If In a case like this where this has been created by another organization long after the fact. They might also explain some of the colloquialisms or some of the little words or terms or phrases that aren't as common today. They may even explain some of the laws surrounding why these records were created. And that's important to understand, understanding the laws about why some of these records are created. Things like um, the law that men would be taxed when they turn 21 years old helps you understand what genealogical value you can get out of these particular records. Now, let me just share with you a la uh, last couple of thoughts the first one is um, when you find these records, for me anyway, one of the things I found easiest to do is to create spreadsheets or tables in order to track people in the tax records. So for example, I would just create a spreadsheet that lists the years across the top and then the names of the people as I find them in those tax records for a particular family or a particular surname. Again, that's going to help me track, oh look, this guy showed up. Did he just turn 21 or did he just move into the area? This guy disappeared. Did he just 
did he die or did he move out? I need to go look for property records. And really quickly in a table or a chart, I can see that information. It also helps me start to see relationships between people. If I've got 20 men with the same last name living in the same county, that could be you know, a grandfather, his sons and his grandsons. It could be two cousins and their children. Um, but starting to track some of this information and seeing those men, particularly the men with the same names, helps me kind of start to sort through them all. So I use spreadsheets um, to do that more often or tables um, in, a, in a program like OneNote. Okay, a um, couple of bonus tips. Um, always jump to the beginning of that tax book, learn more information. One of the things you're also going to discover sometimes about the laws is you learn who is exempt from particular taxation. Um, always read those column headings. So always scroll up to the top of the page. If they're not there, sometimes you have to go back several pages. Um, like old tax record or like old census records, sometimes old tax records, the the tax man only wrote the headings on the first page and then you know he recorded 50 or 60 pages worth of tax information in columns but the headings are back at the beginning of the book um, also pay attention to whether it's an alphabetical list or whether it's not if it's not alphabetical okay then you're going to need to jump back out to the search and make sure you search for all surnames in that location all of the same surname in that location if it is alphabetical, um, that's a little trickier because you don't know who the neighbors are, but you usually will then see the family all together if they're living in the same community. Now, if they're living in the same county, that doesn't necessarily always mean they'll all be together because sometimes those tax lists get broken up by specific community. Well, that is all I have for you today on tax day. Hopefully you've got your taxes taken care of and you can go dig a little bit more into the tax records of your ancestors. Lots of really great genealogical information to be discovered from these lists of names that help us know when and where people lived, when and where they died, um, and how they managed their lives and their property. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.